Hello again friends, this is A Look in the Dark, Chapter 3, first part, it will be in two parts, and Chapter 3 of A Look in the Dark is called Agreement. Danny Green had, go, had so much going through his mind as he travelled home in the afternoon after the visit to George, and he was the other side of Dorchester before he noticed that he was out of Weymouth. Reasoning that some music might be an aid to better focus in his thoughts, he reached for a tape. It was Gershwin, Rhapsody in Blue, usually Carol's choice, and that pleased him because he just couldn't wait to see her. Also, Gershwin inspired him because, despite lack of formal musical training, the composer had written some remarkable 20th century music, a real portfolio of his times, and Danny felt that it gave him something to aim at with his writing. He was sure that ability could manage to navigate its way through life, and it seemed to him that lack of opportunity was more so a handicap than lack of education. And of course, Carol said that opportunity had to be pursued and hunted, that it was no good waiting for it, like waiting for a bus. The aging Ford Escort took him along twisty way home as Gershwin excited his senses with a classic jazz mix, stirring up his thoughts of Carol. Beginning to relax now, he took delight in the Latin names on the Dorset signposts, names such as Nethercern and Minton Magna that remained as misty reminders of Roman Britain rolling time back two millenniums. Once he crossed into Somerset and more familiar roads, he quickly completed his journey arriving home with over an hour to spare before Carol's train was due. He made a choice. Rather than prepare a meal, he would take her out for one. When they were courting, they had dined out often, but not so much since their marriage. Well, tonight, as he changed his clothes, Danny felt like he was courting again. He had that same slightly nervous, overly joyful, concentrated feeling of well-being. That had been his for their first dates. He couldn't wait. Drinking his coffee while it was still too hot, he glanced at the kitchen clock and couldn't believe that it was still 35 minutes before he could see her, if the train was on time. A few minutes later he was driving down Loxhill in Froome, turning right onto Portway and right again to the station. Standing on the platform he hardly noticed the old school friend who passed and asked if he was alright. Sorry Paul, how are you? I didn't see you. Ignoring Paul's witty comment, Danny looked again at his watch. The last 15 minutes were dragging and the man in the ticket office had assured him that the train was running on time. He tried studying the feral pigeons on the ground near his feet and wondered where they lived before there were railways and public buildings. He also noted the beautiful colouring around the neck of one of them. Poor feral birds maybe, be be beautiful all the same he thought. As the train cut clacked its way onto the station Carol Green smiled a friendly goodbye to the elderly lady sitting opposite her for the last 35 minutes of the long journey. The old soul had hardly looked up from her magazine, and Carol still struggled with the southern English way that allowed two people to be in close company and yet learn next to nothing about each other. As Carol struggled from the train with a case, a young lad with a Mohican haircut opened the door for her. As she stepped from the train, Danny spotted her and hurried along the platform. When the diesel driver gave the engine power to tow the carriages out into the countryside, the reunited couple were still enjoying a slow lingering kiss, and that kiss communicated more about their feelings for one another than any, other, any spoken word ever could. The old lady on the train watched them and thought about her man now gone. Her smile was a bittersweet one as she resumed her journey through Somerset and life. Carol tried to catch her breath. You miss me then? He looked into the cheeky face and the ever-sparkling green eyes that had attracted him in the first place. Holding her tightly in his arms, he tilted his head back so as to better make contact with those eyes. Well, Danny replied, I had to cook for myself and it was very quiet. Aye, surely, and you play in dire straits at full volume, no doubt. And not a thought about the neighbours. How he loved that county to her own accent. Sweeping up her case, he took her by the hand and led her to the car. As he accelerated away, she said, It's grand to be with my ornithological husband. Ha! Huh. And how's my favourite sister-in-law and all the rest of them? Annie's fine. Where are you going? Her husband had driven past the turning on Locks Hill that led to their home. We're eating out. Is this a celebration or have we been a bit evicted? I could have washed and changed first. Sorry, love, I never thought. I need to talk to you and we never eat out. 
Have you broken my granny's teapot? Tell me about Anne before I tell you my news. Carol related all the family news and became very animated when talking about the new baby in Leeds. You know Danny boy, that Davy's not a bit like a cop at all, he's a real laugh. She was referring to her sister's husband. He is such a good father and you, can really, you can't really imagine him booking anybody at all. Yes, Danny knew that Dave loved his job and his family. He booked your sister for speeding though and look where that got her. As the car pulled into the car park at the Cross Keys at Blatchbridge just outside Froome, Carol was relating details of a concert she'd attended in Leeds. Inside the public house she sipped her martini and screwing up her face she said, You look very serious, Dan. What do you want to talk to me about? Has this got anything to do with Richard Claymore? Yes, he sends his love by the way. That's nice. Had a good weekend? Yeah, terrific, but there have been other developments. Did Ricky get a copy of A Look in the Dark? Mm-hmm. Who else did you send it to? Mum and Dad? A few other family members? Oh, and that conceited Colonel Rossiter that treats you like a schoolboy when you when we and him are talking about birds. Don't look at me like that. I'm proud of you. She enjoyed his gentle smile, but behind it in his eyes she could see anxiety. Well, Danny boy, what's cooking? As the two of them enjoyed the excellent meal, Danny Green filled his wife mind, wife's mind with the other developments. He was surprised that she was not surprised when he related Ricky's business practices. Years amid the troubles of County Tyrone and Belfast had left her a lot less sensitive about things like that than her husband. He remembered her telling him that babies around Ungannon were born with shock absorbers fitted. Well, Danny, when a couple of year old classmates were shot before their 25th birthday because they were in the security forces, and then one of your favourite neighbours is arrested for the killings, a little criminal activity over here is not too shocking, is it? Sorry, but it's the truth. Carol had frequently referred to this paradox in her life. Growing up in Northern Ireland and having friends in both communities, Protestant and loyal to Britain, Roman Catholic and Nationalist, even Republican. She told Danny how often it got her into arguments in the family and how sometimes it led to her suffering double the grief. Danny continued filling Carol in about the situation, including the visit to George. Carol had an apt response to him. Well, he sounds a right gulping. Danny had long ago checked out her own expression in the English dictionaries that he possessed, but he'd drawn a blank. Yet at the same time, though Carol had never met George, it seemed to describe him better than any other word in the English language. Carol was surprised at the extent of Ricky's generosity, but she was enthusiastic in her encouragement to her husband. She was sure it was right to accept the offer. She felt that Ricky could obviously afford it, and that it served a vote of confidence as a vote of confidence like when her father had paid Willie Sproul half the money for the new barn in advance because he had total trust that it would be a good job when it was finished. Also, as she reminded him, artists have often depended on patronage in the past. Carol disregarded the embarrassment that he felt and said it was a practical arrangement. So, Carol, Danny had finished his first course and was wiping his mouth with a napkin. What about the birds? The illegal trade, I mean. There's a real danger. Do you remember that guy who was found lying in the Thames last year? Carol nodded. Well, Danny looked around and lowered his voice. The cross keys was filling up now and people were sitting at the next table. He was a legit element dealer and had stumbled on important information about the illegal trade. He mentioned to a friend that he was going to spill the beans. So they killed him. So how's Carol going to react to that? Is she going to say, oh no, let's not get involved in this? Or is she going to say, let's do it? What do you think? The next episode will reveal the answer. Thanks for listening, friends. Love and peace. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.